Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, someone who needs no introduction, Dr. John Scott. Dr. Scott is really one of the thought leaders for ECHO and telehealth. I think you all know him very well from both Hep C and HIV ECHO, and I will just turn it over to John. Great. Thanks, Brian. So Brian asked me to talk today about non-invasive testing for liver fibrosis. Um, this comes up quite a bit when we're evaluating our hepatitis C patients, and I think increasingly we're um, starting to use these tests. So I wanted to, to go over um, you know, the state of the art for, that, for these tests. These are my conflicts of interest. So our objectives for the next 15 minutes are, number one, to understand the advantages and disadvantages of these non-invasive tests, so they're imperfect, and um, hopefully I can give you some context for when it would be useful. And uh, also to just uh, lay out a, a logical testing sequence for, for assessing liver fibrosis with these various non-invasive tests. So first of all, I wanted to um, lay the context, and most of my comments today are going to be surrounding hep C, just because I think that's the most common situation when this is coming up. And the recently released ASLD guidelines, first of all, say that all patients with hep C, whether they're HIV positive or HIV negative, should be considered for treatment. Um, and then, the, then they go on to say, well, these medicines are very expensive. So in the context of uh, a real world where there are limited budgets, they went on to prioritize patients who have more advanced fibrosis. Those are patients who have F3 or F4, and usually in the context of getting a liver biopsy to assess that. Anyone who has extrahepatic disease, so like the membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis or cryoglobulinemias, and then pre- and post-transplant patients. The next category then are patients with F2 on biopsy, anyone with HIV or Hep B co-infection, some of these cutaneous manifestations like porphyria cutanea tarda, um, diabetes, because if you treat the diabetes, uh, treat the Hep C, the diabetes con c control can actually improve. And then severe fatigue is another indication in that second tier. So liver biopsy is key, but it's an imperfect un uh, gold standard. So, th so the biggest issue is that sometimes you just don't get enough tissue. So you need at least two centimeters on a liver biopsy sample. And uh, the pathologist is um, specifically wanting to look at least 10 portal triads, and that usually correlates with a two centimeter sample. So for those of you guys who um, have your interventional radiologist doing it, it's important they use a, a 16 gauge cutting needle, not an 18 gauge, because that's much narrower and sometimes will cut off those portal triads. So if you can uh, mention that to your interventional radiologist, that's really helpful. Um, so there was a very in interesting study that was done by Leonard Seif that um, he took patients who had hep C and they were going to go in for an elective cholecystectomy. So he, as a hepatologist, did a percutaneous liver biopsy. And then the surgeons, the general surgeons, did a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. At that time, they did multiple samplings around the, the liver. And in 10 to 15% of the time, the uh, fibrosis score differed more than two. So that means the, patholo the uh, surgeon got an F4, but the hepatologist got an F2, or vice versa. That's a pretty big difference uh, when, when you're uh, looking at that last slide. And F3, F4, uh, but an F2, you, you may not get the highest priority. Also, when you read your pathology report, if they say there's fracturing, like there's, you know, it came out in chunks, that's usually a good, a good tip off that there's cirrhosis and, and it was just such a stiff liver that it um, was fractured specimen. So, um, you know, liver bi biopsy can miss the diagnosis. I, you know, every year I have a couple cases where um, everything clinically is pointing to cirrhosis, uh, um, you know, low platelet count or low albumin, but the liver biopsy doesn't always correlate. So, you know, you need to look at the whole picture and the whole, whole patient. This is also an invasive procedure. It can have some complications like um, bleeding, uh, perforation of uh, vital organs that are in the area. Uh, we tend to do ours with ultrasound guidance, so that's really reduced the complications, but uh, can still happen. And it's also expensive, around $2,500. A lot of our patients don't like that. Finally, say if you get a good sample, um, there, this is uh, still an art, um, and the pathologist can disagree. So, um, you know, if I ever have any questions about uh, what the biopsy is showing. I go to a, dedic a person who's reading a lot of liver biopsy specimens, a dedicated um, liver pathologist. So I'm going to next uh, start talking about the blood tests that are used for um, fibrosis assessment, and we kind of lump, lump them into direct and indirect markers. Indirect markers include a prothrombin index, um, your platelet count, 
and then uh, also the AST and ALT. And one of the most commonly used tests is called the APRI score, which just stands for the AST to platelet ratio. It's great because a lot of you guys already have it. Um, you know, you can actually do this as a back office. Um, so that's just the AST level divided by the upper limit of normal. Um, so that can vary from lab to lab. And then divided by the platelet count, you multiply that by 100. And uh, then you get a ratio between zero and, one, um, zero, uh, zero and over two. And um, we'll go over kind of what the cutoffs are where you start getting concerned. The other test that we use a lot of and has a lot of um, good validation is the Fibrosure. And that it's a kind of a composite um, algorithm that includes age, gender, and then some of these other uh, less commonly uh, drawn labs, alpha-2, macroglobulin, haptoglobulin. I just wanted uh, to mention that there are a couple um, situations where the fibro test is not going to give you a reliable result, and that's a Gilbert's disease. And it's um, HIV analog, which is atazanavir. So patients who are on atazanavir are often going to bump their bilirubin. So you might want to um, avoid using the fibrosure in that situation. Anyone with hemolysis, uh, extra hepatic cholestasis, post-liver transplantation. And then the probably the most common situation where I'm seeing it being inaccurate is anyone has renal insufficiency. And um, I guess the theme I would say about any of these um, non-invasive tests, especially the blood tests, is that they're quite good at the extreme. So an F0, F1 is, is actually quite believable. Similarly, an F4, you can, you know, that's pretty much money in the bank. But that uh, F2 and F3 can be um, quite unreliable. So uh, just a word of caution for those, those uh, middle range results. There are also some direct markers of fibrosis. They're looking at the um, extracellular matrix that's actually laying down the scar tissue, these metalloproteinases, and those tend to be more proprietary tests and less commonly used. So this is a really nice review uh, from Gastroenterology a couple years ago that looked at you know, all the currently published um, non-invasive tests out there. And one of the most commonly used measurement of the accuracy of a test is the area under the receiver operating characteristic um, curve, or AUROC. It's um, highlighted there in red. And what you can see is that pretty much all of them are right around 80%. So uh, it really doesn't matter uh, what test you're talking about. They're all pretty much in the same area. But I wanted to point out APRI. If you have a patient with an APRI score less than 0.5, or greater than 1.5, then that's, pr that's a pretty reliable result. Um, over 1.5, it's pretty darn sure they're going to have uh, F3, F4, and less than 0.5, uh, probably uh, very early fibrosis. And then uh, fibrosure, or fibrotest is the other name for it, a uh, cutoff of around 0.5 is, is pretty sensitive and specific. So next I want to talk about um, radiologic assessment of fibrosis, and there are at least four technologies out there, starting out with ultrasound, that's probably the most widely available. But then I want to talk about some of these new exciting technologies that are coming down the pipeline and are now available here in Seattle, the transient elastography and shear wave technology, and then MRIs um, probably going to come down in the next couple of years too. So ultrasound, um, many of you order, um, and uh, if you ever see them, the radiologist saying that the liver surface looks nodular, that's pretty um, pretty reliable result. If so if they say that, it's got a greater than 80% positive predictive value. One of the things we like about the ultrasound is that you're getting other information. You can see if there's um, clotting going on, uh, a, a venous thrombosis. You also see the spleen size. So if the spleen's enlarged, that's also quite reliable for there being um, cirrhosis and, and uh, basically backing up with the blood flow. Um, we also use it to screen for liver cancer and sometimes can detect small volume ascites. One word of caution though is not every ultrasound machine is created equal um, and not every um, ultrasound machine is going to have these high frequency transducers and those are much more reliable than a low frequency ultrasound. So um, some of you may not have that available locally. The new um, machine that's uh, been FDA approved uh, about two years ago is a machine called the FibroScan. There's a picture here. So it's, uh, it's basically like an ultrasound and it's measuring the stiffness of the liver. And I, I think it's a kind of a interesting how it came to market. Um, so the French actually invented this to, to, originally they were trying to test the ripeness of cheese. Um, and uh, they, someone, someone was very smart and said, hey, you know, foie gras, then that's fatty liver, you know, maybe we could use this for um, assessing liver fibrosis. And sure enough, it actually is pretty darn sensitive and specific with sensitivities around 84 to 100% and specificities in the, in the 90s. 
So it's nice because it's not invasive. Um, you're just shooting a sound wave and measuring um, how stiff the liver is. The one thing I'd say is it's not quite that great for heavier patients um, because you're, you have to go through more adipose tissue. So in this picture here, you'll see there's two probes. One's for the uh, normal sized person, another one we like to call the American probe. Uh, it's because we're heavier people. But even with that uh, different probe, it's still not as good. So what we've um, been using locally is, is a, a similar technology called acoustic radiation force impulse. It's basically ultrasound with a special um, probe and software. Um, we've liked it because it has applications beyond just liver disease. Um, the radiologists are using for, uh, for breast disease and for thyroid. So it has um, other applications beyond just um, liver fibrosis. And it also gives a 3D picture. We actually think it's more sensitive than the fibro scan, and there's data to back that up. I will just say that we've, we've had it for maybe about three months now, and I think there's still a learning curve. Um, my just personal observation um, is that maybe it's under-reading or underscoring some fibrosis. So just a you know, word of caution that uh, since this is a new test new, and our techs are still learning how to do it, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a learning curve for that. So I, I wanted to mention that transient elastography has been shown to correlate with clinical outcomes. This is a study of nearly 700 patients. Many of them had hep C, but a couple had NASH. And uh, they found that it was uh, quite sensitive in predicting clinical outcomes in the near term. So if anyone had a reading over 10, 10.5 kilopascals, then their, their uh, chance of getting uh, liver failure, variceal bleeds, or ACC was, was quite high. Um, so that uh, might help guide our interventions for treating the hep C or you know, just intensifying our, our surveillance for liver cancer. So just to do a short comparison here on the blood tests on the top versus the TE on the bottom, uh, the blood mar serum markers are great because you know you can do that in your office just about anywhere. You just need to draw the blood, um, and it's been um, pretty widely validated. Um, costs around two hundred and fifty dollars. The one thing I would uh, caution you is that it's not so great in the middle. So anything, if you get an F two F three result, kind of have to be a little bit suspicious there, and it's not quite as sensitive in picking up cirrhosis as transient elastography. Now TE is um, measuring the actual property of the liver. It's got good reproducibility, well validated. It costs around $300, so about the same price. It is FDA approved. Uh, the, the bad thing about it is that there, as far as I know, there's only three machines in all of the Northwest with all of them residing probably within three miles of where I'm speaking right now. It doesn't help many of you guys, but uh, hopefully it will be coming to, um, to your hospitals and clinics. And I uh, just wanted to mention that it, it can be um, difficult to interpret in obesity and if there's any ascites. So I just wanted to uh, review what we're doing here at Harborview um, and, and how we're using some of these non-invasive tests. So obviously we want to reinforce that all hep C antibody positive patients should be getting a, a con confirmatory RNA and we're um, fully supportive of the CDC guidelines to screen baby boomers. Uh, if it's positive, the first step is to uh, evaluate for ongoing alcohol abuse and injection drug use, and if they're having substance abuse issues, then that takes priority. We want to get them plugged in and vaccinated. Um, but if they don't have really any issues, you can get a genotype, LFTs, and CBC, which will help you with an APRI. And if their APRI is between 0.5 and 1.5, that's where we would advise a different kind of test, like a fibrosh or a fibro scan, uh, to confirm it. And then those people who are we think are in the F3 and F4 should be um, prioritized for treatment. So j just a last comment here about liver biopsy in 2014, where, when, and where are we using it? Um, our colleagues in the uh, post-liver transplant setting do these serially still, just to make sure there's no rejection. So definitely those kind of people are getting it. And uh, it still is, is quite accurate in understanding other disease processes. As some, some hep C patients can have more than one thing going on. They can have autoimmune hepatitis or NASH or uh, even hemochromatosis, a quite common disease in uh, Caucasians. But we're really seeing this becoming um, less and less utilized as these non-invasive tests are be better validated and reimbursed. And I really think that ultrasound TE is probably going to be the, the more uh, uh, consistently used test. 
Uh, and I, I guess the other question is, you know, does it even make sense to do this staging? Uh, I just want to mention a study that was done in hepatology that looked at the various um, strategies for, for working up people, and they actually found that just treating everyone, not doing any of this kind of stuff, was the most cost-effective cost strategy. It was based in the UK, so kind of a, a, a study to think about. So in summary, uh, there's no one test that's perfect for assessing fibrosis. The serum markers are quite good at the extremes, but a little soft in the, in the middle. And probably the most effective strategy is combining uh, a blood test um, like APRI with a, a different kind of test like Fibrosure or elastography. And uh, MRI uh, elastography is coming down the road and should um, even surpass the ultrasound elastography.